guests. I am now joined by Senator, Republican Senator Martha McSally of Tucson. Uh, she has had a long history in the Air Force before deciding to serve Arizona in Congress, uh, serving as a combat pilot, uh, did tours in Iraq, Iraq, six deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, made her name as in part as somebody who stood up to Air Force brass uh, and their treatment of women on a deployment in Saudi. Mm -hmm. Correct. Uh, ran for Congress in 2014? 12 the first so 12 time. the first yeah. time, we don't talk about that. One in 2014 and then in 2018 ran against Kirsten Cinema. Uh, it was a very close race, as I told you before, Kirsten Cinema won. Uh, after that, Governor Doug Ducey appointed Martha McSally to the a vacant seat of the late Senator John McCain. Uh, as a result of Arizona law, federal elections law, she now has to run for that seat in 2020, the unexpired two years of the John McCain term, and then if victorious, will have to run again in 2022 for a full six-year term. So as I said before, that is three Senate races in four years, and as she can well tell you, Arizona is now, for the first time, first time was in 2018, we are now a battleground state and we are seeing elections and money pour in like we have never seen before. Uh, and also in the short span of um, really a month, we suddenly had two female senators, U.S. senators, after not having any for the first 206 years, sorry, 106 years, 106 years of Arizona's history. So Senator McSally, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Bram. Uh, as I did with Senator Sinema, we're gonna start with the news of, of the week and transition to some uh, financial economic topics. Right. Uh, I want to start with Alabama, the abortion ban in Alabama. Your response to a question on that, I think, yesterday was, this is a state issue. Uh, as you know, as a U.S. Senator, you do vote on, to confirm judges who are going to have to decide uh, on that ban and other restrictions on abortion. So, you've declared your pro-life. What is your position on this ban, which does not allow any exceptions. Yeah, and to be clear, somebody grabbed me in the hallway on the way to a hearing, um, and I have further uh, responded to that earlier today on a, a radio interview. Uh, look, I'm pro-life with three exceptions, uh, rape, incest, and life of the mother. Uh, there's multiple elements of this at the federal level and at the state level. Uh, there are a variety of state laws that get passed on this issue. You know, at the federal level, we have a couple things that generally tend to be the focus. One is no federal uh, taxpayers' money used for abortion, the, what they call the Hyde Amendment. That's been a pretty long-standing bipartisan agreement uh, over the years. Uh, also, we have um, voted on, anyway, um, a 20-week ban at the federal level um, in the past that has not passed into law. And uh, just recently, we voted on um, a bill that simply says if someone uh, survives an abortion that they have to provide life-saving care to them. It's the Born Alive Bill, uh, which most people you would think would be for, but unfortunately uh, it got turned into a political game as well. There was actually a survivor of a botched abortion standing outside the chamber when that vote happened, so this is not just like a hypothetical game. Uh, so, you know, we do see various uh, restrictions uh, and things that are happening at the, at the state level. They will work their way through the courts for sure. Uh, for my part, um, those three exceptions really matter to me. Uh, you know, I believe in the sanctity of life, but as someone who recently revealed I'm a survivor of rape as well, um, I, you know, th those three exceptions are really important. So I don't understand why they didn't have those exceptions, and I, I think that is too extreme. Um, and um, we'll see again how this, how this plays out uh, through the court system. I think, you know, what I will tell you when I'm out and about around Arizona, and people have very strong, in some cases, and very deeply, sincerely held beliefs on this topic. Um, most people find themselves in a place where they don't understand why we can't agree that infanticide is a bad idea, right? And that we should all try to work to figure out how to, how to prevent unwanted pregnancies. Uh, you know, no woman or girl wants to be in a situation to have to make these difficult decisions. Uh, but on the other end, I mean, the exceptions of rape and incest and life of the mother are very mainstream among even the pro-life community. So um, most people, I think, are even if they are pro-choice, uh, uh, believing there, uh, there should be limits on you know, late term or born alive abortion. So where can we find even uh, having a conversation about where that limit is? So is that where you'd like to see the Supreme Court end up if it reconsiders Roe v. Wade, uh, abortions only in the case of rape, incest? Uh, well, or again, we'll let, we'll let it work its way through the court. Some of this is a discussion on states' rights versus an overarching you know, federal restriction, right? That's, uh, that's fundamentally where some of the 
uh, you know, some of the challenges are. But, um, we'll, you know, we'll see where these cases go. But um, my focus at the federal level, again, is can we figure out, like I've support, you know, Title X funding, figure out ways the low-income women can get access to birth control, you know, support community health centers and others that provide that to prevent these unwanted pregnancies. Uh, and when we are protecting life, it's not federally funded taxpayer use of abortion, you know, for abortions uh, and having those exceptions of rape, incest, life of the mother. And again, we voted on a 20-week ban in, in the Senate and the House. Okay. I want to move to health care and kind of check with you because I think your position is changing or evolving based on something. Yeah. Fake news. Fake news? Okay. Well, I want to run by you something you said last week. Uh, in a scrum with my fellow reporters, uh, you said... We're nine years into ACA. Let's stop bickering and look at real uh, the root issues. What is the art of the possible? And as I heard you saying that, when I heard you say we're nine years into this, you seem to be accepting this is the law of the land. Let's deal with it. What can we do? Versus two years before yeah. when you went into a caucus meeting and said, let's get this effing thing done uh, in voting for the AHCA. Yeah, so was. again, things can be taken out of context, mm -hmm. in which case both of those are. Uh, I, I'm a very pragmatic, uh, problem-solving minded legislator, and that's a reputation that I've had since I've been in the House. Uh, and look, if we could start at the beginning, before the Affordable Care Act even was put into force, and identify what are the root issues. The root issues are people with pre-existing conditions couldn't get access to health insurance. You probably each know somebody who's in this situation. Somebody very close to me actually filed for bankruptcy because they had diabetes because they couldn't afford their health insurance, they couldn't get access to health insurance, or people getting dropped, or the caps that were there. So we, ha we can't go back to where we were. I mean, there's some real problems that needed to be fixed there, and people were, being, were falling through the gaps. If they didn't get insurance from their employer, if they weren't on the employer market, or the VA, or TRICARE, or Medicare, or Medicaid, it, right now that's about 7% of people that are on what we call the individual health insurance market. And you think of all the money and all the effort and all the kind of federal element that went into what the Affordable Care Act was trying to do, was trying to close that gap there, right? So that people who didn't have access to those other means could actually not be denied health insurance and get access to it. The reality is that the Affordable Care Act, the individual health insurance market, is the most unhealthy part of the, the market right now because there's so few options, because you don't have a balance of young and old and sick and healthy and everything. These are complex issues. Uh, and so the individual health insurance market, I meet people every single day who have pre-existing conditions who can't get access to health insurance right now because they're entrepreneurs, they're small business owners, they're in between jobs, they're retiring early, they're going back to school, whatever that is. That's the whole gap of that 7% of people. So if we could start all over again on the whiteboard and say, like, how would we address to provide more options for these people, I think it would be very different from what we've seen with the Affordable Care Act. But, you know, you live in the world we're in. And so what can we do now related to health insurance that actually provides options right now, today? So association health plans is one of those. We've got now initiatives in southern Arizona where 15 chambers have come together. And they, wor they worked with United Healthcare, providing 17 different health insurance op options for small businesses that they've never been able to have provided to them before. This is something that the administration came out with a rule on, but now it's being challenged in the courts. Mm -hmm. This is something that actually is working for people. So where can we, instead of the rhetoric right now, on the left you got people running for president saying the government take over health care, you have other people just repeating you know, mantras um, on my side of the aisle. The reality is that people are living in the middle of all this and they're frustrated with Washington DC that they're not doing something right now to fix what needs to happen to provide more access to health insurance. So the Association of Health Plans is what I'm trying to do right now to fix a problem. Additionally, all of this discussion has nothing to do with the underlying cost of health care. Prescription drugs, surprise medical bills, just because you have health insurance doesn't mean you have health care. And none of the debate over the last several years or discussion has been, where can we understand where the underlying health care costs are? And what can we do to try and drive those down with innovation, with technology, with transparency? All the kinds of things that are frustrating people all over the state. In my 15 county tour I did in the first 90 days, this is a top issue that came to, m that came to me. From, all, from seniors not being able to avoid their prescription or afford their prescriptions, or again, moms who've got a kid who just got a diagnosis, not wondering if they're going to be able to afford the care for them. So the real world, everyone's living somewhere in the middle of all this, and I'm just trying to be constructive and thoughtful and listening and actually enact things that are in the art of the possible to fix the problems we're having right now. 
So, uh, and one of the reasons I bring this up is this was a huge issue in the Senate campaign last year, likely will be again, it's been in campaigns around the country, so I'm just trying to get a better yeah. fix if I did repeat some fake news there. Uh, do you support the Trump administration's uh, support? They're asking a federal judge to yeah. throw out the Affordable Care Act and declare it unconstitutional. Do you support again, that? Again, it's not my role, uh, but in my view, if we could start all over again, we would do it differently, but we are where we are, and even during the discussion, on what would we have replace it, I repeatedly talked about how, look guys, I'm a pilot, so I use airplane analogies all the time. We're landing an airliner, not a helicopter here, and so whether you like it or not, I mean, the impact of the Affordable Care Act has weaved itself into the way small businesses operate and the way insurance and hospitals and everybody operates. So these are really complicated issues. And so if we're going to move towards something better, it needs to be in a way where there's an off-ramp and you move it in a way that you're not responsible then for, you know, the Obama administration was criticized for, you know, all the, if you like your doctor, you can keep it. So w we don't want to be doing massive changes on a, you know, immediate basis in something that needs an off-ramp, even if we're going to go to a better model that provides more options and choice at lower cost. That's my practical view. Okay. Let's go to immigration. Uh, Arizona's economy is doing well, yet at a recent tourism roundtable, I was at hotel owners and others say yeah. they can't find enough employees, and they asked specifically for visas yep. uh, for tourism workers. That's a huge industry here. They asked for visas, H2B, they asked for yeah. help. What can you do for those businesses, that industry? So it's not just that industry, it's also, I uh, hear from farmers all the time, uh, you know, the agricultural guest worker program, they, there's just not, uh, it's too cumbersome, so many agencies are involved, so that's the H-2A, the H-2B is what you're talking about. Uh, but everywhere I go in Arizona, the economy is doing great, but the main challenge is people are looking for workers, and that's up and down the, the skills chain, right? Uh, we've got a lot of Americans that still have mismatched skills, even though the unemployment level is low, so we've got to make sure that they have the skills for the training that they need. But we need to modernize our legal immigration system, and that includes the H-2B program, the H-2A program, so that we can have the ability for us to legally you know, bring in uh, support to our economy that is not taking jobs away from Americans, but filling in the gaps that's not going to continue to hold us back. So, I mean, I support a very robust guest worker program for the industries where it makes sense and where it matters. Uh, without suppressing wages or taking jobs away from, from Americans. Uh, and uh, when I was in the White House last week, uh, I was asked to come kind of listen to the pitch they were making related to modernizing the legal immigration system. Um, I was disappointed to see that the guest worker part of it is not included in the proposal. They, th they said they were going to deal with that separately. But I think it's all kind of part of us being a little bit more nimble and responsive to where the economic needs are and allowing a legal immigration system that fills in those gaps. Uh, I asked Senator Sinema this question about trade. Yeah. Uh, I'll phrase it the exact same way, so sure. take it where you want. The audience will find the contrast, I'm sure. Uh, how much pain in the form of higher costs for goods should businesses and consumers here in Arizona and around the country, should they tolerate in order for President Trump to get the trade deal he wants with China? Let me just say I'm a free and fair trader at heart. Uh, we got to you know, make sure that we remove trade barriers, which includes tariffs and then also non-tariff barriers. 95% of consumers are outside America, right? Uh, the reality is, though, that China has been cheating for a very long time, and not just in the way they do business, not just in the way they, you know, jobs are taken away from American workers, but where I focus a lot is on the national security front. Uh, they're stealing of our technology, either illegally or legally, their forced technology transfers, stealing of our intellectual property. It is a very real national security threat, and it's an economic threat. And it's, you know, multiple administrations ignored it as we watched China continue to cheat with their state-run companies or subsidized companies. So I appreciate the administration trying to take this on. Uh, I'm deeply concerned about how long this is going to go on and the impact of a trade war and the impact of tariffs. The economy is doing well. Uh, but there's certain there's sectors for sure that are feeling the pain uh, more than others. I met with um, Western growers this week. In fact, I was on the phone with the president earlier today, specifically to say this is not the answer. Relief to farmers is not the long-term answer. But if you can provide some relief in order to c create, you know, the negotiating space in order to win and get a good deal. Uh, the relief that came out last time didn't include a lot of uh, the farmers in, in the western region in Arizona that are being hurt. And that includes beef, that includes tree nuts like pistachios um, and almonds, and it includes um, alfalfa, cotton. There's a couple of a lists that uh, 
we're going to be engaging to see if they're putting another package together, can we at least consider some of these other areas instead of it just being focused on soybeans and some of the ones that have seemed to gotten the most attention. Um, and I also wish, and I've communicated this, uh, that we would be teaming up with our allies to put pressure on China, kind of doing it all together because us with our European allies and others in Asia, you know, we end up, you know, we're like two thirds of the the world's GDP. So if, you know, they have the similar challenges with China, so if we could crank up the pressure together uh, to try and get a breakthrough sooner, uh, then that would be my, you know, my, uh, my preference than trying to go alone, go it alone. Um, we did see some relief that just came today. Uh, the president told me about it before it was announced on the uh, steel and alum aluminum uh, with Mexico and Canada, hopefully paving the way for USMCA. But either way, I mean, we got to get through this, but we can't, like, be naive and, and be, na be naive about China and their activity and kind of what their long game is. We've got to figure out how to team up and use pressure. I, ironically, I mean, you may have seen it in the media, but uh, you know, Chuck Schumer is, is, is with President Trump on this. Have you seen some of the way he talks about this issue? I mean, it's, it's a pretty fascinating uh, dynamic. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard him not in public settings talk very strongly uh, about uh, his, his approach related to this. And so I was like, wow, okay, this is a very strange, uh, Bedfellows here. Uh, I neglected to mention the committees you're on: uh, armed services, yeah. uh, banking, um, energy and natural resources. I chair the water and power subcommittee there. We were able to shepherd through the drought contingency plan as the first, you know, major piece of legislation. Indian affairs. We've had a long-standing, um, always since the uh, the beginning of that committee. We've always had an Arizona on it. Twenty-two tribes here, and then also the select committee on aging. We do have a growing aging population. A lot of people I are noticed. moving here from across the country. And uh, so that's an important committee as well. Uh, I want to get to privacy. I wish I could have done this with Senator Sinema as well. Uh, one of your aides told me you just want to scream when you think of this issue and you deal with it on the banking committee. What is it that makes you want to scream? Uh, look, I'm not, I think I'm out of the ordinary here where I, in a lot of ways, I deal with my friends and other people. Like, I am a privacy hound. I just am. I mean, it's, I, at heart, it, you know, this whole model that we have businesses right now that they get to, whether it's you know Facebook and others, that their whole model is they collect your information, they sell it, they profit off it, and even again, people are like, oh, if you're not doing anything right, that's not the point. Like it's just you know I'm not going to put location services on my phone, and no, I'm not going to give permission for that app. So I'm a little bit living in the dark ages because I'm like so hypersensitive to this issue. Every time I get one of those notices in the mail, you got to write a letter to opt out. You know, I like sit there and write a letter to opt out. I'm one of those weird people because I'm like, you don't get to, you know, just because you can doesn't mean you will. And um, so I really think, you know, we are addressing the privacy issue in the banking committee, but I think we need to do it in a way that actually provides like you know, clearly available to individuals what is being collected and for what purpose uh, and how they're able to opt out uh, of it or in, in some cases it should be opt in, right? I mean, why, why can't I opt in uh, depending on kind of what we're talking about? And it needs to be kind of streamlined across the, the business community when you're talking about some of the digital privacy issues. You got, you know, some entities trying to do certain things for the internet service providers versus the content providers. So I just, I don't know. Sometimes I think there's a higher awareness going on now with some of what's been going on with Facebook and Google and others where people are maybe a little bit more mindful. But I, I, know, I have like a bunch of libertarian friends who are like, you're supposed to be like really super privacy hunted. And they're just like, yeah, they're sitting there on Facebook all day and they got all these apps on their phone. And I'm just like, you just, you're basically, we're like lemmings, where we're where we're we're sacrificing convenience for not even understanding what is being collected. If you could at least know what's being collected, I think that would be helpful. I think most people would be mortified if they understood what is being collected and how it's being used. So why don't we raise awareness and let people know that and allow them to say no? Okay. And even that's a business model that like, hey, I'll pay for your use. You know, because you can't, obviously companies can't, if all their profit model is taking your information and selling it, then they got to somehow have a business model, right? So if there's a way to change the business model, so like, hey, I'll pay for your use, just don't collect my stuff. But the problem is there's not enough people who are like thinking like that. So we got to have to have the demand be up that, you know, we are tired of it. Okay, I'm going to ask one follow-up question, yeah. then we'll turn to you for your questions. So you sit on the Senate Banking Committee, what are you going to do about it? Well, we're working on it. So on the issue related to banking, which is one of the many, you know, many issues. I mean, it's probably uh, the ones that I just mentioned are really more of where the, the challenges are. 
Um, I, for, for example, I mean, here's it's just like a silly thing. You, you, so when I've opted out of these and my you know various you know credit cards or whatever, I still get a notice every single year, and I can't I don't remember whether I've opted out or not. So I end up doing it again because pa based on previous law, you still have to get sent it every year. Um, so I think we, in a bipartisan way, the chairman is w you know working on some options related to standardizing the privacy related to banking but also uh, making sure that it is easy to understand and across uh, the, the sectors so it's, a not a, it's not where there's an unfair advantage to one part of the industry versus others, if that makes sense. Uh, your questions, again, please tell us your name and the organization you're with. Hi, I'm Joanna Ossinger with Bloomberg News. Um, thanks for being here. So I have a couple questions. One is, um, you talked about getting allies to help um, take on China. Do you think there's any appetite from allies, like in Europe, for instance, to do that right now? Um, the second thing is, what do you think is the one thing that will get you past Mark Kelly's challenge next year? Um, on the first one, I think there's absolutely, absolutely allies. Um, again, our European partners and, and others uh, in the Pacific region are dealing with the same um, uh, unfair practices by China, and it's impacting their economy as well. Uh, so uh, I've had conversations with some of the ambassadors um, from those countries and uh, again there's no formal, they're not formally at the table for the negotiations. We uh, talked about this very topic with the Vice President on Tuesday when he was at our Senate lunch. Um, but I think it, it would give us more leverage if, if there was a little more formal relationship working with the allies um, uh, to be able to crank up the pressure uh, on them. But I very much, there, I mean it's, it's no surprise to any of our allies about ch China's practices and how it's, uh, they have uh, taken advantage of the system for too long. And again, they're either cheating or stealing or using uh, you know, sta state subsidized companies to be able to uh, outmaneuver out us and outcompete us. And they always have a 100 year plan. I've been studying them for a very long time. We always look five feet in front of us and they're always looking 100 years down the line, playing the long game. So it's gotta stop. Uh, on the, look, on the election, I, I just, for crying out loud, I feel like I just got out of the last election, and uh, I think most people feel that way. I think I should introduce legislation that says, you know, you can't talk about campaigns for an entire year. Uh, let people do their jobs. My view is this. I won my house race when I eventually won in 2014 by 167 votes after a 43-day recount. In 2012, I thought I won. I went to freshman orientation, was in the photo, and I had to go home and concede after 14 more days of counting ballots. I photobombed the freshman photo. But um, <laughs> so, in you know, in 2014, I won by 167 votes. In 2016, I won by 44,000 votes. Now, obviously, it's statewide versus Southern Arizona. But what I did in those two years is I worked my butt off. Uh, I got out and about to the community. I was an effective legislator. In my first two years in Congress, of the 435 members of Congress, I was by an independent outside agency, a uh, university was ranked the ninth most effective member of Congress based on how many bills I actually got passed to solve actual problems. So tirelessly working, tirelessly listening, being a pragmatic problem solver uh, actually allowed me two years later to win by 44,000 votes. In a year, by the way, my district voted for Clinton by five points, so I had a headwind that year. And so being an effective legislator, being an effective representative, uh, actually made a difference. People are, ti I'm tired of politicians who go to DC and all they think about is how they stay there. I mean, that's one reason I ended up stepping up to run in the first place, because I was just tired of the nonsense in Washington DC. Part of our culture as veterans is if you're complaining about something, you better be willing to do something about it. So my, my view right now is I've been given this opportunity to be a senator for two years. And I lost my dad when I was a kid and he was 49 years old. So I tend to look at things like, this could be the last two years of my life. What am I gonna do to make a difference now? Very few people in the country have been given the opportunity to be a United States Senator. Like, I take that responsibility very seriously. And so my job right now is to, when I get up in the morning, when I go to bed at night, focus on be a good Senator, right? Be out listening. I've done a 15 county tour all over the place in snowy mountains of all over Arizona. Listening, what are the top of mind issues for the people I represent? We've already gotten major legislation passed. So be effective, make a difference, Hold it with an open hand. When it comes to the time of the time for the fight, we'll fight that fight, and I hope I'll be given the opportunity to continue to serve. But I'm not going to get up every day and think about how I cling on to this. I'm going to think about how I make a difference. We have a question over there. Uh, yes, uh, Senator, I'm Jim Tankersley from the New York Times, and uh, I have a question about the the trade policies and the payments to farmers. Yeah. Um, if tariffs are a tax, as they're generally understood by economists, on consumers, um, and the payments are to are to farmers. 
uh, specifically as an industry group, how is that different from socialism? Uh, so again, um, I we are trying to give some some maneuvering space. This is a short term. It's a short term issue to be able to get a breakthrough with China on these very real issues that need to be addressed. They have to be addressed. Okay, um, and so we're trying to give some relief in the short term. Um, again, I'm not, I'm a free and fair trader, just to be clear. You know, I don't think, I'm not a, I don't get up in the morning and think tariffs are a good idea, okay? Uh, so I hope we get a breakthrough soon, but in the meantime, those who are being harmed in the short term, getting some relief and support, uh, but that can't go on for a long time because when the markets shift and when the markets change and those farms close, like they're not coming back. And my, one of my major concerns is China's not as accountable and responsible to their people. Even if they are feeling pain over there, like they don't, they're taking the long view, right? And, and so, um, y you know, we want to be responsive to the people we represent and make sure that they're not harmed. And um, so I'm concerned about whether even when we have the conditions where really they should be giving on the things that they know right well they've been cheating. And the reports are that obviously they backtracked on some of these issues in the last few weeks. And it's particularly on the enforcement side, right? How are they gonna enforce the, the, the forced technology transfers and the stealing of intellectual property? And we gotta make sure it's not just a on paper agreement, but it's being enforced. Um, you know, I, I'm, again, I'm really concerned about it on the national security front, but I, I, like, I'm concerned about where this goes and how it ends. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm gonna advocate for, uh, in the short term, some relief for the people who are being harmed. Uh, as we hope for breakthrough. But I, I'd just like to follow up some of the, the original question. How isn't that socialism when we're spending billions to prop up a specific industry? Okay, well, socialism is obviously more of a collective approach as a governing philosophy, and if you want to know more about that, just run for president <laughs> on the Democrat side. <laughs> I mean, there's plenty of them who all of a sudden think like socialism is, is a really great idea uh, as a governing philosophy. Like this is the way we should govern our country is through socialist policies. Obviously that's not the same of what we're talking about here on a very targeted issue where we're trying to fight for America's interests and stop China from cheating. Sorry. Uh, over here, we'll Senator. Right there. Hi there. Uh, you have previously touted the benefits of uh, nuclear. Oh, uh, who you are and what you're Oh, I'm sorry, uh, with, Rory Sweeney. I'm a, a freelance reporter focused on uh, energy issues. Uh, You've previously touted the benefits of uh, nuclear uh, energy for reducing carbon emissions in the, in the power industry. Um, some uh, nuclear uh, generation owners have warned that their units are becoming ec uneconomic, and some states have uh, passed legislation to funnel um, money to keep them uh, running so that they don't um, t to maintain the, the carbon benefits. Do you support subsidies for nuclear units, and if not, how, uh, and, and the units need to shut down, how do we address uh, emissions issues? Yeah, so I believe in a true all the above energy policy and our nuclear infrastructure, we have Palo Verde generating station right here. That's a, a pretty significant, uh, a largest generator that we, that, that we have. That's uh, significant for our power needs and also it's clean. And obviously that infrastructure was invested in a long time ago. Most of the plants around the country are aging. Uh, and there are, you know, the conversations about capital investments or, or new smaller units or what you do with those units and how you maintain that economic viability is a conversation we definitely need to have. Uh, you know, as we have green energy, the same conversation happens, right? Whether it's wind and solar or, uh, you know, natural gas, like ha how do we fulfill our needs and make sure that if there's any disruptions that go on, whether it's through pipelines or obviously we haven't figured out how to store the energy yet in an efficient way from, uh, from solar uh, power. Like how do we balance all this? Uh, biofuels, by the way, is another one. I don't want to get totally off topic, but we've, uh, you know, have the opportunity to have a win-win here. We've mismanaged our forests for a hundred years and it becomes a real threat to life and, and, uh, and our economy and, uh, uh, and uh, so much because of the, the, the mismanagement that it's very difficult to have a s simply a private uh, incentive for some of these forests to clear out the stuff that's actually not economically viable, but it is a, and, and the biomass is not economically competitive, but how do we have a conversation that's mostly at the state level, but a little at the federal level about how this is a part of the, can be a part of the mix, and how do we, 
come up with a policy that addresses that versus just a straight market driven policy. So I mean, these are some of the conversations we need to have going forward. Um, we've got a great energy boom going on in uh, uh, you know, natural gas uh, for energy independence in North America. That's great. But things could shift, right? So I think having that portfolio of some nuclear, uh, you know, the, the, the wind and the solar and the natural gas is kind of where we need to have that balance going forward to make sure that we're not all investing in just one element. We have time for one more question. Anybody know you've asked? How about have you asked a question yet? Okay. All yours. Hi, I'm uh, Russ Britt with Investors Business Daily. Uh, you talked briefly about health care. And uh, this is sort of a, I'm going to assume for a second here, forgive me if I'm wrong, that you believe that it's more of a privilege than a right. Is that correct? Uh, that, that's not the way I would frame it. I think everybody deserves access to health care, for sure. So you believe it's a right? I believe everybody deserves access to health care, yes. Now, okay. I don't believe in the government takeover of health care, and we can sit and talk about how we provide that access, uh, what is the best way to do that. Uh, and that's happening right now, of course. If somebody, anyone, whether you're, wh wherever you're socioeconomic, whether you have insurance or not, whether you're here legally or illegally, you go to an emergency room, and they're not going to turn you away, and they're going to provide you the care that you need. So that's already happening. The question is, for public policy purposes, how do we provide health care to people at an affordable you know, rate for them so that th we can have life-saving and life-sustaining uh, options for them to be able to fill out their full potential? How do we make that work? This is a very complex issue. So um, these sort of you know, polarized binary questions I don't think are helpful. Uh, the issue is, mm -hmm. how do we, given the complexity of it, uh, given the challenges that we have, but also we're America. When we put our mind to something, the innovation, the breakthroughs that we can have using technology and other things to provide more access to more people, especially in rural areas, which we have real challenges with here in Arizona, or veterans or others, like what's the best path for them while still investing in R&D and investing in innovation so that we have the absolute best uh, healthcare and we have these breakthroughs which we're on the cusp of to find cures for cancers and Alzheimer's, and all those things. Uh, that we are, I think, really close to having happen. Do you believe that in order to keep costs down, there should be more of a consumer mentality that goes along with it? Um, you know, I, I certainly wish that um, we had more information. It's the only thing in our lives. You know, you don't, you don't go buy a car and drive off the lot, and three months later you get a bill uh, that, like, this is how much it cost on top of everything you thought it cost, right? Again, it's more complicated than that, but it's one of the few things in our lives that you just have no idea usually, what you're paying, or uh, y even like, for example, on prescriptions. We had a hearing on this in the aging committee, and Con Consumer Reports was trying to figure out, like, where is the best kind of out-of-pocket cost, even given the plan you have? When your doctor says to you, I have a prescription for you, where should I send it? Do you have any idea whether Walgreens or Walmart or Safeway or Fry, like, what's going to be the better price? You have no idea. Why can't we have an app? you know, from Expedia that allows you to kind of look and go, I mean, like Expedia-like, I'm not advocating for a particular business, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Something that allows you to go like, hang on, let me check. You know, it's, it's $35 here for my copay, and it's 22 here, and it's I'm going to go this one. I'm going to drive two more miles because I, I value that. Or you know what? I'm tired. I got a long day. I got to pick up the kids, you know, and if I have the means to, maybe I'll pay the, you know, 10 more dollars because I'll go to the one right around the corner. So having that ability for consumers to know, for them to have information on hospitals, on what the cost is, for especially for elective things. You've got to get a knee replacement. You should be able to kind of shop around. Uh, what is the cost of this? And what's the quality? Uh, you know, just the cost and the quality so they can identify, like, where they want to go and let that help drive some of their decisions. It's easier to do in urban areas for things like that than in rural areas where sometimes they don't have a choice. But I think the more consumers are engaged, uh, and we're able to drive some more transparency and choice, I think that will help for sure. And we'll have to end it there. Senator McSally, thank you so right, much. Thank and you. thank you, everybody.